Welcome to Post-Human Reflections, an introduction. As you can tell from our first week, week and a half, uh, we are focusing on the ramifications of technology. Um, just looking quickly at the definition of post-humanism, we're dealing with the idea that humanity can be transformed, transcended, or eliminated either by technological advances or the evolutionary process. Uh, and technology, of course, is playing into that in a big way, as that gives us more control over how we evolve. And so the purpose of showing you the clip from 2001 Space Odyssey, that was sort of the moment, at least according to Stanley Kubrick, this uh, when man sort of recognized his ability to manipulate nature and then was therefore no longer at its mercy. Uh, so we will be looking at that. Um, also, uh, I hope that you've watched the lecture on humanism in the Renaissance. It's a really good lecture that explains how humanism has kind of contributed to where we are in this post-human era. And you can see that during humanism, the, the humanist era, that we moved sort of away from the church and the community, the church community, to focus more on the individual. And this is sort of where the individual's happiness and pleasure start to become more important than, than the, the law of the church, I suppose. Um, so that's it. kind of this, what's setting the foundation for where we are now. And transhumanism, which is part of this post-human lens that we're looking at things with, um, is dealing with the issues of super longevity. So this is sort of looking at the idea of aging or the act of aging, the experience of aging as really a disease, that death and disease, um, death and aging, sorry, death and aging are diseases that we can cure, that we, again, this is, we've always been sort of at the mercy of this. But now uh, people are working toward stopping this from happening. Um, along with this, there's super intelligence. And more and more, we are starting to edit our bodies and our minds to merge with machines in order to achieve this super intelligence. We see it already. Uh, I mean, right now, our phones are on the outsides of our bodies. But science fiction, which you know, science fiction 20 years ago has already become science reality today. So this idea of being able to merge with a chip in our brains or, um, I mean, Google Glass was trying to sort of put the images that computers allow us to see right in front of our eyes. Um, and no doubt somewhere someone is working on a way to make that so you don't wear it on the outside of your body. <laughs> um, so, so that's something to consider as well. And then finally, we have super well-being. And this has to do with editing our genes. Um, for happier, more content human beings. And that would include parents being able to select the genes that their children would in fact um, get, and so what would then be passed on. Now, this raises a lot of questions, um, most of which will be, of course, asking about the ethics of the situation. This is just kind of a starting point, and some of you have touched on this already in the, in the discussion forum. Um, that first dialogue was really good in terms of what you guys are sort of bringing to the surface as questions to consider. So I'd like to add to that that um, some of these come from that post-human transhumanism introduction lecture, and then some of them are my own, and I pulled the ones from that lecture that I think are the most important to consider. Um, but indeed, what would a future without aging look like? How would we manage population growth? And in a way, what would a future without death look like? If we were able to preserve ourselves and never die, and indeed become immortal, I mean, what kind of world would that create? I suppose one of the things that I think makes us human is our awareness of death and our awareness that we are mortal. And if you look at literature over time, it's, that always plays into the story. So that would change the narrative, and I think in a lot of ways that would change what, it, what a human being is. I don't know that a human being then would exist anymore if we were to do away with death. But that's just my point of view, and um, it's a question to consider and to, to discuss more in depth, that what would happen without aging, what would happen without death. Um, what are some of the ethical ramifications of man's merger with machine? 
what if AI's goals differ from our own? And will this artificial intelligence demand rights? And there are already several films out there. That film Ex Machina takes a look at that question, but also Blade Runner, which is based on the Philip K. Dick book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? If you've never read that, um, I mean, it, it's been required reading um, in high schools, but I don't know that everyone gets exposed to that text, but this that book raises those questions and sort of explores that territory. Mm -hmm. And the film Blade Runner, which is based on that book, does the same. So if you've got some time and you're interested, you know, I would recommend watching that movie. But we have other ones too. I mean, there's AI that came out in, um, in the recent past. So there's, there's, there's films that are already dealing with these particular questions, but how indeed would we handle this if suddenly artificial intelligence became its own race and developed enough consciousness to sort of no longer be at our beck and call and do as we want them to do? Um, and this, this leads into the question then, is consciousness purely biological? Can machines have consciousness? And to go back to 2001 Space Odyssey, the computer, at the end, the computer takes on its own mind. It does have its own consciousness. Um, so, but, it, but is it purely biological? I don't think we really have an answer to that question yet. What does our increasing reliance on computers mean for our future? Um, and, and good and bad, I don't want it to seem like I'm trying to lead everything into this dystopic understanding of the future that as long as we continue, you know, evolving our technology, we're going to ruin our ourselves. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a big question mark. Um, but what, what would it mean? What does it mean that we'll, you know, that our reliance um, on computers grows exponentially as time goes on? Additionally, what are some of the ethical considerations of genetically modifying children's genes? Um, and this connects with the question of how important is happiness to our drive for progress, um, which that, that question can be looked at independently of the, the genetic selection question. Um, but if that is sort of the motivation for editing genes, um, what are the ethical ramifications of that and how important is happiness in general? Um, which then leads on to the question, will we be able to eliminate suffering and is, isn't suffering sometimes a good thing? I think this kind of ties in to questions of religion because religion seems to embrace that suffering is also part of the human condition. And if we did away with that, again, how is that going to alter the definition of a human being and how is that going to change how we live and how we relate to one another. Um, and then uh, who would own the technologies that would make all of this possible? I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's fun to kind of get excited and I get a little creeped out by some of this stuff myself, but thinking about the inequities that already exist in our society today, it's, it's a safe bet that not everyone would have access to these sorts of technologies um, because they would be very expensive. And so only certain people would be able to become this sort of superhuman um, or this super intelligent, um, super long living and super well, you know, healthy, I guess, um, human. And so would it, I mean, is there a way for it to level the playing field or would it just exacerbate the inequities that already exist? Um, and so who would, be, who would be responsible for these technologies? Who would own them? Should they be owned? And finally, where do God, and I, I use little God to include um, just the sort of the idea of God, but then also God, the, like the Christian God, um, and intelligent design factor into this paradigm? I mean, some would say that man is actually the intelligent designer. Um, I don't know how I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I necessarily agree, but I think that there's a, an, an argument there that's worth listening to. Um, and that we are, in a sense, becoming God. So these are all the questions that I think are worth exploring. Um, like I said in my comments on our, on our module, that if, there, if any of these questions interest you, but they don't seem to fit under any of the umbrellas for research paper topics that are listed on the research paper guidelines, you're welcome to still pursue them um, as they are related to the theme of the class. So just let me know in your research proposal 
what you're interested in pursuing. And I'm really looking forward to the evolution of our conversation about this particular theme um, during the next few weeks.